All right. Most common bugs causing meningitis. Name me some. Strep pneumo. Neisseria meningitis. And H flu. Listeria we worry about in the old and young. So in little bitty babies and in old people or anybody who's immunocompromised, we'll also think about listeria and so add ampicillin to our treatment regimen. In people who've been recently instrumented in the brain, now we worry about staph and we treat that with vanc. Um, some other random causes, tuberculosis, remember, can also uh, infect the meninges and we add steroids to our ripe therapy for meningeal tuberculosis. And Lyme disease can mimic almost everything. Lyme disease really sucks because any clinical presentation could be Lyme. I don't know. Um, so we treat Lyme meningitis differently than regular Lyme disease. We have to give IV ceftriaxone because it penetrates the blood-brain barrier. Um, so if you have a patient you're suspecting meningitis, what's the best first step? Antibiotics first, and before you do the LP, remember you always want to check for signs of intracranial pressure. So, you know, look in the eyeballs, look for optic swelling. Um, if it's indicated, get a CT to make sure there's no intracranial swelling. Um, but really, the most important first step is to start empiric treatment, especially if they've got, like, horrible bruising, spotted rash, you think it's meningitis. Uh, so what about if you're the roommate of the kid who has Neisseria meningitis? Rifampin, good, so random, right? Rifampin is Neisseria meningitis prophylaxis. So you give that to close contacts of known disease. So um, for pneumonia, if you are thinking the patient has pneumonia, what would you do first? Good, we wanna see it. Uh, and what's the most common bug causing pneumonia? Strep pneumo. Most common bug in you and me, healthy young people, hopefully. The atypicals, right? So mycoplasma is the most common, um, and that, remember, is associated with cold agglutinins, and we treat it a little bit differently. A macrolide is the first line of treatment here. If the patient is hospitalized within three months or is in the hospital for more than a week, we start worrying about HAP, hospital-acquired pneumonia, or healthcare-associated pneumonia, and those bugs are a little bit different. What bugs are we worrying about there? Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, E. coli are the main ones. And the treatment's a little bit different there as well. Uh, old smokers with COPD are more prone to a certain kind of pneumonia. H flu. Old smokers with, with COPD more likely to get H flu. Um, the alcoholics who have the current jelly sputum, there's Klebsiella. And the old dudes who hang out in the hot tubs, <laughs> That's Legionella. Joe Danabom always talks about that. He's like the old man in the hot tub. He has Legionella. I don't know why. So uh, a lot of books describe Legionella pneumonia as pneumonia plus. So it's the, the common respiratory symptoms of pneumonia, but they also might have diarrhea. They might have um, altered mental status. So it's pneumonia plus syndrome is Legionella. Uh, if they just had the flu, what might grow in their lungs? Staph. And <laughs> they're a farmer. They just delivered a baby cow in the barn, and now they're, uh, they got pneumonia and vomiting and diarrhea. Q fever. Coxiella Bernetti. Wait, what did you guys say? <laughs> what? PTSD. Oh, no, wrong shelf, wrong shelf. Okay, so that these are kind of random, but you guys just took step one, so you should remember this, right? Okay. What if they just skinned a rabbit? This actually was on my shelf. Tularemia. Tularemia. So if they like live in Arkansas and skinned a rabbit and they, not cause, not cause of Arkansas, but they've got, it's, it's, it's a well known geographic association. Um, whatever. Okay. Tuberculosis. So remember, if the patient has, sim has symptoms and you're really worried about TB, got to get a chest X-ray to see what the involvement of the lungs is looking like. For screening, we get the PPD, and there are different thresholds for positive PPD depending on uh, your level of risk. So if the PPD is positive, the next test is always a chest X-ray. If the chest X-ray is positive, we really want to get a sputum culture and do acid fast staining of the sputum. If the chest X-ray is negative, it takes three negative sputum cultures to reassure us that, that we're okay. If the chest X-ray is positive, we gotta treat them for nine months. Um, 
or six months, as it says here, with four drug treatments, and then we can narrow down after the sensitivities come back. Um, uh, a question I got wrong, so I put on this slide, the only people who get chemo prophylaxis, like if they have a known contact with someone with proven TB, the only people who are given INH for prophylaxis are little babies, or little kids under the age of four. Everybody else, you don't treat them until you diagnose it. So just being exposed to someone with TB um, isn't enough to warrant treatment. So they love the side effects of these medications. So what are some side effects of rifampin? Orange, right? My daddy went to UT. He always wanted to take this so he could be, you know, patriotic for his school. So your body fluids turn kind of like a reddish orange. It's also an inducer of cytochrome P450. INH, neuropathy, so we give B6, yep, pyridoxine with it. Uh, pyrazinamide, kind of random. Eyes is a thambutol. Pyrazinamide really doesn't have very many side effects. It can give you a hyperuricemia, but it's usually not enough to cause gout. Uh, a thambutol causes optic neuritis, and it's like E for eye, eye symptoms with a thambutol. Okay, so endocarditis, the most common bug? Acute endocarditis? Staph. If it's acute, if it's attacking native valves, it's more common to be staph aureus. Uh, if it's subacute on um, native valves, then the most common bug, sorry, I said most common valve first. The most common bug is Bearden's group strep, and the, most, the, the valve that's the most commonly affected is the mitral valve. Okay. So if they're an IV drug user, you're thinking staph, and what valve does it attack? Tricuspid. Yeah, it's more likely to be right. And remember, right-sided heart murmurs. I didn't mention it earlier, but right-sided heart murmurs are always worse with inspiration. So that's how you can tell the clinical vignette is pointing you in that direction. So we diagnose this with blood cultures, then we want to do an echo, and then there are major and minor criteria that I'm sure you've seen in your books. Uh, what are we worried about as complications for endocarditis? Yeah, so emboli, definitely. Emboli to either the lungs or the brain are an are important complication. The most common cause of death is actually due to the just local destruction of the valve. So um, congestive heart failure is more common to kill them, but we do worry about uh, emboli as well. So treatment for endocarditis depends on what they have. Um, and prophylaxis for endocarditis, they like to ask questions about this. Who needs prophylaxis? So you need prophylaxis if you have a prosthetic valve, any kind of um, mechanical valve that's not yours. If you've ever had endocarditis in the past, you need prophylaxis. Or if you have like a VSD or a ASD, other congenital lesion that hasn't been corrected yet. Those are all indications for endocarditis prophylaxis. And, ah, so important. What do you do if you find strep bovis bacteremia or strep bovis endocarditis? Colonoscopy, why? Because it's associated with colon cancer. Very good. Okay. So HIV is huge on this test um, and the complications and other opportunistic infections associated with it. So when is the clinical vignette trying to suggest to you that they're talking about HIV? If uh, the patient travels a lot for work, that, that in USMLE land means they have a lot of unprotected sex. I don't know why, and my husband travels a lot for work, so it makes me really nervous. Um, anyway, other things, uh, remember the acute retroviral syndrome looks a lot like mono. So if it looks like mono, uh, even if you're pretty sure it's mono, if, you know, next best step is the question and HIV test is an answer choice, pick it. Um, if, the, if the young patient has a new Bell palsy, Bell's palsy, and they're not pregnant, um, HIV can cause Bell's palsy. HIV can also cause thrombocytopenia. So if the patient just feels crappy and their platelets are low, do an HIV test. Um, anytime there's an unexplained weight loss, or you have any opportunistic type infections. If there's thrush, uh, HSV, um, shingles, Kaposi sarcoma, any of those AIDS-related illnesses, suspect HIV. So in terms of treatment and prophylaxis, the highly active retroviral therapy, you usually start it when CD4 count goes below 350, that's the, the threshold, or if the viral load is over 55,000. Pregnant ladies get a lower threshold because we want to prevent um, transmission. 
Uh, what am I doing here? Oh, these are side effects. So what HIV drug causes uh, leukopenia, GI symptoms, and macrocytic, macrocytic anemia? Some of these are kind of random, but this one I would know. No, it's a drug. What HIV drug causes this? Out of this list, this is the only one I would memorize for sure. It's sidovudine. And the macrocytic anemia is important. If you've got an AIDS patient, they're anemic, uh, you know, you look at the smear and there are macrocytes, sidovudine is really, really classic for causing both a decrease in white blood cells and a macrocytic anemia. The rest of these are kind of random. Pancreatitis is caused by dodanosine. Um, uh, really bad hypersensitivity reaction can happen with abacavir. Uh, kidney stones and hyperbilirubinemia can happen with adenivir. That's a, a protease inhibitor. And then, like, really bad psychotic symptoms happen with efavirenz, and that's a non-nucleoside reductase, NNRI. It's an NNRI. So um, as far as, as post-exposure prophylaxis is concerned, anytime you have a needle stick injury with an HIV-positive patient, you're treated with a triple drug um, regimen for four weeks. So um, not one drug, not two drugs. You always need the highly active retroviral therapy for known HIV exposure. So in our HIV patient, if they present to you with dyspnea on exertion, they've got this non-productive cough, fever, chest pain. Oh, I told you. We're thinking pneumocystis, right? So PCP is, is the most common opportunistic infection. And this is what the chest X-ray likes, looks like. It's not very impressive. It's kind of some fluffy bilateral um, infiltrates on the chest X-ray. Uh, and of note, the LDH can be elevated in the blood. Um, the best test after a chest X-ray? Yeah, we want to see the sputum. We'll get um, Not sputum, but we'll want to get a sample. So bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, we need that to, to actually see the bug. First line of treatment, trim sulfa. What if you're sulfa allergic? Dapsone. Or pentamidine. So dapsone with trimethoprim, um, primaquine clinda, I've never seen that used, but aerosolized pentamidine uh, is another alternative. And then when do you add steroids? When it's really bad. When the pneumonia is so bad, their arterial blood gas dips below 70. And prophylaxis, when do we give it? Less than 200. Very good. So less than 200 CD4 count, we give it. Trimsulfa is the first line. And the same drugs used for treatment are uh, second, third, and fourth line, respectively. Okay, so our HIV-positive patient for, has diarrhea. There are three main flavors of this. So CMV, uh, MAC, and cryptosporidium can all cause diarrhea in an HIV-positive patient. With CMV, we can see this on colonoscopy and biopsy. We can actually you know, do staining for the virus, the intranuclear inclusions, uh, and then we can treat it accordingly. MAC, um, it's kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. We can't really see. The biopsy is going to be negative on the colonoscopy. There won't be any, like, stool, ova, or parasites uh, on the testing. But cryptosporidium, those are the ones, those are the little parasites whose oocysts are acid fast. So with CMV, we can see it on biopsy. With cryptosporidium, we can stain, use an acid fast stain for the oocysts. And MAC, uh, we prophylax for that. If the, um, if the CD4 count is really low and we can't find another reason for the diarrhea. Okay, so um, HIV patients are also privy to a whole host of neurologic symptoms um, and neurologic problems. So if we see on CT multiple ring-enhancing lesions, what? Toxo, good. What if there's just one? Primary CNS lymphoma. How do we treat them? Pyrimethamine sulfadiazine, I think is how you say it. And you actually treat them both the same. Any ring-enhancing lesions in an HIV patient, treat with a trial of pyrimethamine sulfasalazine. And if it gets better, we know it must have been toxo. If that one lesion is still there, we're thinking maybe it's CNS lymphoma, and you might consider a biopsy. So um, really multiple versus single helps you see whether infection or cancer is more likely. But in real life, and on the test, you treat them both the same. You treat them with antibiotics and see if it helps. So um, if an HIV-positive patient has a seizure 
and they have this weird deja vu aura, and then you do a spinal tap, and there are 500 RBCs and CSF. That's characteristic for... Anybody done neuro? What, what does a deja vu aura tell you about a seizure? Where did it start? Temporal lobe. What virus goes to the temporal lobe? HSV. HSV is also um, known to have a small amount of red blood cells in the cerebral spinal fluid. It's a hemorrhagic, um, slightly hemorrhagic spinal fluid. So HSV encephalitis is what we'd be thinking there. And we treat with acyclovir ASAP. As soon as you suspect it, don't wait for viral culture, don't do an EEG, treat with, um, treat with acyclovir as soon as you can. So uh, the most common cause of meningitis in an HIV-positive patient, it's actually strep pneumo. But what else are you worried about opportunistic infection-wise? Yes. So cryptococcus is a consideration in an HIV-positive patient don't get me wrong, the most common cause of meningitis is still strep pneumo, whether they're HIV positive or not. So we'd be worried about cryptococcus, though. We do an India ink test to, to look for that, and amphotericin IV is the drug of choice. Uh, what if our HIV patient has hemisensory loss, visual problems, and a Babinski? Kind of sounds like MS. These patients kind of present with a picture that looks like multiple sclerosis. It's associated with a virus. AIDS patients get it. Think back to Dr. Krolik back in the day. It's PML, PML, the, poly, the JC polyomavirus. Y'all remember that? So this disease um, is demyelinating. That's why it has symptoms that are similar to MS, and it preferentially affects the gray-white junction. So here we really need to do a brain biopsy to, to tell whether or not we've got it. And it doesn't really matter because there's no treatment. The treatment for, for um, PML is just to improve the CD4 count. And lastly, if we've got an HIV patient, this is sad. They're like in their 30s and they've got like pretty bad dementia, not walking well, not remembering stuff well. There's no other cause. Yeah, AIDS dementia complex. So um, not really anything we can do. You rule out all the treatable causes and then um, give supportive care. Okay, so neutropenic, neutropenic fever, is that a big deal? All right, so when they present to the ER, what are you not going to do to them? Stick your finger in their butt. So neutropenic, neutropenic, neutropenic fever patients never get a DRE. Why not? You can. You can induce bacteremia in these patients uh, by inducing translocation of, of normal gut flora across the wall. So never, ever digital rectal exam. So we define neutropenic fever by a single temp that's super high or a sustained temp that's a little bit uh, more low grade for more than an hour. Uh, and the absolute neutrophil count is less than 500. So the most common cause of bacteremia, we kind of hinted to this, is mucositis. Any, anywhere along the GI tract, the bacteria can just translocate due to the inflammation. Uh, most common bugs here are Pseudomonas and MRSA, especially if they've got a port for chemo. And the workup here, you always want to get a blood culture. Uh, and then start antibiotics. So ceftazidime um, and cefepime are the, the most common drugs of choice. So we'll add vancomycin if um, they've got a port or you've got reason to suspect a line infection. And if the patient doesn't get better within five to seven days, add amphotericin because maybe it's fungal. So um, things to remember for the exam, this is a big deal, and don't put your finger in their butt. So other random infections, what gives you a targetoid rash, fever, cranial nerve, seven palsy, meningitis, AV block? Lyme disease, it can do anything. What do we treat it with? What if I'm a six-year-old kid? They can't have doxy, amoxicillin, good. That's kind of a dirty question. That's more of a peds thing, but uh, it could be on there. So. Um, what if you have a rash that's at your wrist and ankles, palms and soles, fever and headache? Rocky Mountain spotted fever, what do we treat it with? What if I'm a six-year-old kid? Doxy anyway. <laughs> Rocky Mountain spotted fever, um, amoxicillin doesn't work. So even if the kid is under age eight, eight is the cutoff, uh, everybody gets doxy for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. So what if uh, you've got a history of a tick bite? The, the dude saw the tick bite him, but there's no rash, but they do feel like crap. They've got myalgias, fever, headache, 
Their platelets are also low. This is a random one. Oh, my God, you guys are so good. I pimped my, my radiation oncology resident on this today, the chief resident. I was like, hey, what are the symptoms of air lycosis? He was like, screw you, go write the patient note. <laughs> True story. Anyway, um, we also treat this with doxy. So take-home message, if a tick bites you, take doxy. Because no matter what it is, even if you can't remember what exactly the bug is, if the question is how to treat it, the answer is doxy, unless you're a little kid uh, and you're not suspecting Lyme. So what about in an immune-suppressed patient? They've got a cavitary, lung disease, weight loss, fever. Um, and when you look at the sputum, it's got gram-positive um, um, bugs that are branching, and they're partially acid-fast. No cardia. Very good. So no cardia. Those are the ones that are aerobic because they're in the lung, and that's where air is. Uh, and you treat it with trimsulfa. What about the other um, branching bacteria that is anaerobic? Yes, that's actinomyces, um, and for this, we need high-dose penicillin. 